Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Walter. Good day, young man. How are you doing? As same as yesterday. And what's that good? Uh, considering the circumstances, yes, I think it was fine. I'm glad to hear that. Well, We're living in a war, did you know that? A, a war flesh and blood. Well, the mortars are exploding all around, so we must expect that. But be of good cheer. I read in the spirit of prophecy, we must always depend on God. Does that link in with the Bible? Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Yes. And if we don't, then we won't have something to fall back on. Correct. Today we're going to talk about questions and answers. Yeah, right? some interesting topics that we're going to discuss, but we'll need the Holy Spirit to help us. Let's pray. Our oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together again. Lord, we need you in our midst, please, and we ask that the Holy Spirit will enlighten our minds and guide our discussion. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, it's good to be on the forefront of what's happening in the world, but it's also important that we, you know, just take a little bit of time to answer some of the people's questions because there, there are serious issues out there and there's, there is a lot of confusion and a lot of misunderstanding mm -hmm. that can be clarified. So I think it is also important that we do this every now and then. Definitely. Like you said, especially misunderstandings. It's prevalent. And our first question is probably one of the most misunderstood yes. questions. What is it about? Is Walter Fight a Freemason? <laughs> are, there, are there actually people that ask that question? There's actually people I don't think that only ask the question that say that it is so. I see. Well, I think uh, some time ago there was a web page that said I was a Jesuit. And uh, there are people that say I'm a Freemason because, you know, every now and then you talk and you... You use your hands and people get confused and they think, oh, there's a hand signal. That person must be a Freemason. Well, the answer to that question is uh, no, <laughs> not a Freemason. I've been together with people that have had affiliations to societies and secret societies. But fortunately, the Lord has spared me that road. I have never been part of a fraternity never wanted to belong to a fraternity, never did belong to a fraternity. Uh, there were occasions in my career when there were possibilities of joining societies in order to further your, your influence, but I have shunned them my entire life, even when I knew nothing about them. I just felt that uh, that was that was something that was morally not acceptable to me, and uh, not that I was, you know, super moral or anything like that. But uh, I hated it when there were favors because of affiliations. Mm. Things should be on merit, and that's it. Yeah. So now I've never been a Freemason, and I do not want to be a Freemason. And people that ask questions like this, have they ever watched Total Onslaught? What is, the, what is the whole aim? Is to show that these affiliations eventually are in direct conflict with the Word of God. Well, if I can state, if you were a Freemason, you're not very good at it. No, and if I was a Jesuit, I'm even worse at it. <laughs> yes, because you're exposing them the whole time. Absolutely. I mean, if you take the Jesuits, for example, why were they created? To counteract the Reformation. And uh, in my opinion, if you counteract the Reformation and you counteract the Word of God by distorting it, then you are an enemy of God masquerading as an angel of light. Thank you. Clearing that up. So let's move on to the next question. Why is there an obelisk on the grave of Ellen White? Well, this is very interesting. Uh, <laughs> you know, there are people that will say that she was a Freemason. Yes, there's a lot of people that say Adventism 
the pioneers were the Freemasons. Freemasons. Correct. So while we're on the topic of mm -hmm. Freemasons and secret societies and all of these, let's talk about these things and let's, let's be quite open about it. Uh, obviously, I was not always an Adventist, right? Mm -hmm. and neither were you, correct? So there must be pretty compelling reasons why you would uh, adopt something that seems to be uh, so negatively portrayed in the world out mm -hmm. there with so many things written against it that you will really have to investigate the issue yes. to see if, uh, if there is merit in it at all. And so people will say, okay, there's an obelisk on Ellen White's grave. Actually, it's not on her grave. It's a memorial. Yes. These, these tiny little stones over here are the actual gravestones. And there is an obelisk as a memorial, which was placed there by well-meaning people. Now, if you, if you take the time period in which this was done, there were virtually obelisks everywhere. Mm. It was the done thing. And that doesn't necessarily mean that there was an affiliation. So how do I judge whether she had affiliations or whether she did not have affiliations? By her writings. Yes. Does she talk about Freemasonry? Yes. Does she condone it or condemn it? Condemn it. Absolutely, in no uncertain terms. She goes so far as to say, if you do not break your affiliations with these secret societies, you will exclude yourself from the kingdom of heaven. Yes. Correct? Correct. So by what is written, you must judge. The same with the Bible. Exactly. Don't tell me about the Bible. I heard enough about the Bible in my life. I want to know what does it say. Read it yourself. Read, it. Read Ellen White's writing herself. And if they offend you, put them away, then stick to the Bible. And I assure you, if Ellen White offends you, the Bible will offend you too. Yes. Yes. I was reading chapter 23 of Acts of the Apostles, the book that she wrote. And I'll encourage anybody to go and read that chapter. It is on the Bereans. Yes. And how you should study the Bible for yourself. Absolutely. And you must study the writings of Ellen White for yourself. And you must study the Bible for yourself. And it is good to partake of the counsel of many, mm -hmm. but be careful from which source you take your counsel. So if it is uh, a counsel from people that were prepared to give their lives for the cause, mm -hmm. like the reformers, you do well to read what the reformers said. And those that uh, were derided and mocked and ridiculed for their faith and stood firm like, a, like an anchor in a firm place. Yes. You can read those writings and uh, then you'll have a pretty good idea what Christianity is all about. If you read Bunyan's works, mm -hmm. then you know that that man suffered for his faith. And what comes out there is in absolute harmony with what the scriptures say. Uh, choose your sources. Yes. And if you want to inform yourself as to what the other side says, because sometimes it's necessary yes. to know the moves of the devil, then fortify yourself with this word mm -hmm. so that you don't go into battle and you have not got the breastplate on to resist the fiery darts of the devil yeah most of the time it's important like you just said read the bible for yourself read what alan white wrote herself read it yourself correct and then make up an, a better opinion if somebody just tells somebody else of what you said don't believe it no. come and listen to what you said directly correct and if you take some of the incidences where she talks about secret societies and their affiliations she makes it quite clear that all of these secret societies are not in the order of God. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Jesus himself said, I have done nothing in secret. So why should you have secret societies? And that which you do in secret will be shouted from the rooftop. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the news is replete of things that are done in secret. Yes. And whether they are true or whether they are not will one day be determined in the judgment. So judge by what you read and not what you see and not what other people say. Correct. 
So there is more to this issue. You have a picture here of these very simple tombstones of James and Ellen White, which uh, have nothing to do with anything or cult whatsoever. And here is a general picture of this graveyard and just look at the number of obelisks. So would you say that every single one of these had uh, Freemasonic connections? It was a prevalent uh, custom in the 1800s. Correct. To put a monument in the, in, uh, next to your grave. And then they say, why do early Adventists pose with their hands in their pockets on photos? Or why do they stand with their hands inside their jackets? Because that is a Masonic signal. Mm. Now the very idea of a mas Masonic signal, it must be something that is common out there. I mean, if you made something, a signal that was totally uncommon, people would say, well, what is he doing now? There must be yeah, some significance attached weird. to this, right? So some weird gesture. But a signal picture in Freemasonry is something that is specifically connected to a particular circumstance and uh, a particular message. Yes. And there are specific photographers that take the pictures at very specific times. For example, when they shake hands and they're almost reaching, and then there is a specific caption about something that is to happen. That's, that's a signal picture. Now, people make these gestures all the time. That doesn't mean that they're Masons. No, and I th I'm sure even Freemasons or secret society members don't always mean a message when they do those signs. No, they, it's they're for talking and they're using their hands and they're making a sound. Now, somebody will take a picture of that, right? And say, oh, Walter Feit is a Freemason. Look, he made the hand signal. No, you're, you're just talking and you're generally, or you're sitting like this. Does that mean that when uh, Donald Trump, for example, sat like this all the time, is everything a Masonic picture or is this just a habit of his? Mm -hmm. It, uh, you have to distinguish and you have to be very circumspect yes. when you use these things. Now, when you take these pictures, why in those early pictures did the men mainly sit like this? You must take the history into account. When photography first was developed, it was a very different process to what it is today. Today, you can take a picture in a split second. In those days, the exposures were incredibly long. Sometimes a picture was, had to be exposed for 15 minutes. So you had to sit very, very still. still. Mm. They actually had instruments of iron where they would clamp the children's heads and clamp them into position so the child wouldn't be able to move. <laughs> And then after the development, they would uh, paint those out. So there was a lot of drawing in the, yeah. in the final product. And so one of the ways in which the early photographers dealt with this is to say to the people, you must uh, take a specific pose. Lean on something so that you don't move and so that the other hand stays still. Put it in here and keep it that way. And then freeze for 15 minutes. And because the little children couldn't freeze for 15 minutes, you clamped them. <laughs> that must have been quite an ordeal. <laughs> no wonder nobody's smiling on the pictures. <laughs> There's no time to smile now. <laughs> and then eventually, as things improved, that was no longer necessary as the exposures became faster. So you must take the historic uh, picture into account. So... If you look at those early pictures and you want to assign a secret society connection to a picture, well, then virtually everybody was involved in secret societies. So, you know, calm down. Calm down to a panic. Look at the historic connections. Judge people by what they write mm -hmm. and not by a picture here and a picture there. Yeah. Why do you constantly preach about the law? There's such an issue regarding the law. 
And uh, if you take the churches out there, the conflict as to what part and what role the Lord plays is phenomenal. Yes. You yourself come from a charismatic background, right? Yes. And was the law an issue? They used Romans to tell us the law is not applicable in the New Testament. To oh, us so there is, there is no law, right? No, so perhaps it's only the, only the law of love that Jesus preached, the two laws. Uh -huh. Love your neighbor and love God. On these two hang the law yes. and the prophets. But nevertheless, people say, why do you preach about the law all the time? Preach about the love of Jesus. Forget about the law. Now, I think we should just spend a little bit of time on this because yes. it's very confusing to some people. Mm -hmm. So why do we constantly preach about the law? Well, Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So the law is the schoolmaster. Now, that means it has an important role. When you go to school, it's to learn something, right? Yes. What are you supposed to learn from the law? you learn that you need Christ. Yes. Okay, so the law plays a very important part. If it weren't for the law, you wouldn't need Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and if it weren't for the law, Christ needn't died. So, correct. Now, let's just go into that. You actually said that uh, they used Romans? Yes. To tell you that you do not have to keep the law? Mm-hmm. So let's go to Romans. You know, Martin, even Peter says that Paul writes in such a way <laughs> that it's hard to understand. And uh, I'm always amused when I see these movie depictions of uh, the Bible characters and they look like, uh, yeah. <laughs> like cavemen <laughs> and they are depicted as these backward people and yet they are so learned that we ourselves struggle to understand yes, them yes right correct and then peter says that uh, people distort what they write to their own destruction yeah so we have to be very careful when we read what paul writes and he uses uh, very interesting styles and personifications mm -hmm. he personifies things and uh, you, have to, you have to follow his argument from cause to effect yes. in order to ascertain what is he saying. If you take a verse out of, out of context, you're going to get into big yeah. trouble with Paul. He's such a learned man that he sometimes quote other people. And if you know, you have to know he's quoting other people. Otherwise, you can use that text to say this is what Paul's actually Correct. saying. Correct. He's quoting dictums and uh, learned sayings from philosophers, yeah. and then he debunks them. Yes. And if you don't know that he's debunking them, you might believe that he's actually agreeing with them, right? Yes, especially if you go to that Berean when he went to Athens, and he spoke he actually used some of the sayings that the sages had and all of those Correct. things. So you can be very uh, confused if you don't know what to Absolutely. Say. Let's go through Romans chapter 3. The very f opening verse says, What advantage then has the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? See, the question is, haven't these things been done away with now? Then what was the point of being a Jew? What was the point of knowing all of the sacrificial systems and the ceremonial laws and all of the rituals mm -hmm. that they performed. What was, then at, at, what was the advantage if it's going to be done away with? Yeah. So that's the question. What advantage then has the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Mm -hmm. And his answer is much every way. Okay? So it's not something to be swept away and yeah. ignored. No, there was a great advantage of it, chiefly because that under them were committed the oracles of God. Mm. The Jews received the oracles of God, which included the law. Yes. 
right? And that was advantageous, yes. according to Paul, mm -hmm. not a negative. God never made a mistake by giving them the law. Correct. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written that thou mightst be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. So we have elements of judgment in here. What is the standard of judgment we have to ask ourselves? Mm -hmm. Obviously the oracles of God, right? Correct. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taken vengeance? I speak as a man. So what is the situation? Are we righteous or are we unrighteous? Unrighteous. We are unrighteous. And if God says we are unrighteous, is God then a liar? No. Only if you're the devil Correct. will you have such a statement, statement right? Yes. So God is righteous. Mm -hmm. God is true. God gave the oracles to the Jews. And he said that we were sinners. And that is what we are, whether we like it or not. Right. So then he says, God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? That's a very important question. Yes. If you want to judge the world, there must be some standard of judgment, right? Exactly. So he's setting a tone here. Mm. Has he negated the Jewish economy? No, he's actually uplifted it. Ah, uh -huh. okay. For the truth of God has more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? So he's using a personified contrast. <laughs> he's saying, my whole life is actually a lie, and God is absolutely just, I am judged as a sinner. Yeah. That's what I am. So my condition is I'm a sinner. God is truthful when he says I am a sinner. God is going to judge. And the judgment says I'm a I'm sinner. sinner. <laughs> I'm in a bad spot here. Yeah. So I need, I need uh, a I solution need, yeah, to this problem. And not rather as we be slanderously reported and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. But you know, Martin, we have exactly the same situation today. There are preachers that say, and I've heard them with my own ears, that if you keep the law, you are sinning. Yeah. Have you heard that? Yes, I have. Yes, if you keep the law, you are sinning. Because then you're actually breaking Jesus' law. Correct. So you must break the law in order to be just with God. It's, it's amazing. So this is what he's saying. And not rather as we be slanderously reported, and some affirm that we say to this very day, mm -hmm. let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. So in other words, if you're saying, if you keep the law, you are sinning, then uh, you better watch it because the damnation is coming. No. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. So we need to understand what sin is. Mm. And the Bible tells us quite clearly, we'll come to the verse, that sin is the transgression of the law. So in no way is he negating sin, mm. nor is he lifting himself up yeah. above others. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So what he's doing is describing the condition of man. Yes. We are all sinners. And in this, sometimes you hear that people say, you s feel yourself righteous because you want to keep the law. No. The knowledge of what sin is doesn't make you righteous. The doing 
is something that is also important. That's what the whole epistle of James is about. Yes. But uh, And it still brings you back that all are under sin. All are under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. It's just an affirmation of our condition. Mm -hmm. Our condition is pretty hopeless. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. That's our condition. He's describing our condition. Hopefully there's a solution, right? Yep. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So even my so-called good deeds are nothing but filthy rags because they all spring from an element of selfishness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their way. And the way of peace they have not known. <laughs> it's, it's a, a description of my condition. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not very rosy. No. Now, it's interesting that he says here in verse 17, and the way of peace they have not known. Now, if you go to Psalms 119, it says, Great peace have they who love thy law. So they have not known the way of peace. They didn't know the law. The law. Mm. Now, is the law peace? No, it's a, a schoolmaster that tells me I'm in trouble. I need some help because my condition, as described here, into it, which includes himself, because he includes himself yeah. in it, uh, is pretty pathetic. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law, now, what does Paul mean when he speaks about under the law? It means under the condemnation of the law. And he's just described that. Correct. We've all been declared sinners, and what we do and what we say <laughs> is like an open sepulcher. Yes. It's full of dead <laughs> men's bones. <Yes. laughs> We're in a bad, bad way. No. That every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. That's our condition. All the world. Don't talk of your righteousness. Don't tell me how wonderful you are. Don't tell me what kind of a philanthropist you are. Mm -hmm. We are all under sin. We are all dead men's bones. Yes. Open sepulchers. Yes. It's a description of our condition. Now, the next verse, verse 20. Now, in my Bible, as I've said before, mm. uh, a new paragraph is in bold type. Mm. So I can see in my Bible here that verse 20 is in bold type, and he's going to now discuss this issue. And he says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So there is nothing that I can do that can save me. The law cannot save me. My good deeds cannot save me. By the law is the knowledge of sin. The law just tells me what is right mm -hmm. and what is wrong. Sin is the transgression of the law. So when I look at the law, I see myself a sinner. And he's described my condition. Yes. Where do I find the solution? Well, the law has just explained to me that I am pretty much in trouble, right? Yep. It makes me turn to Christ. Mm -hmm. So when I look at the law... And I see myself as in a mirror. I say, oops, I'm in trouble. And then I look to Christ. And there is my solution. Not in anything that I can do. Because a dead man cannot lift himself up. 
Can a dead man tie his own shoelaces? No. No. He's dead. So can a dead man uh, make himself alive? No. No. You'll have to have some power outside of yourself if you want to come back to life, right? So what is the, the, the role of the law? It tells me what sin is. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now the law and the prophets is your entire Bible. Correct? Yes. So the Bible tells us that my righteousness doesn't come from anything that I can do. Mm -hmm. It comes from a source outside of me, an alien righteousness. A righteousness which has to be imputed, imputed because I don't have any. Mm. Good. And the law and the prophets, in other words, the Bible testifies to this fact. Now, where does this righteousness come from? Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. The only way I can attain to this righteousness is by faith mm. in Christ. Yes. Then he reiterates in verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So what is Paul saying? The Lord tells me what's right and wrong. It condemns me to death. Yes. I have no solution within myself. I cannot save myself. Not even the very best things that I do, do can atone for my wickedness. I'm an open grave. My path is a path of destruction. Yeah. It is a schoolmaster, the law. It brings me to Christ. There lies the solution. He is the one that imputes and imparts his righteousness. Because we are all sinners and come short of the glory of God. And how are we justified? Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So it's a gift. It's free. It's free. And it's in Christ. It's Not in Christ. Anywhere else. Verse 25 whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. It is a gift from God. And it is through his righteousness. It is through faith in his blood. And this is where Protestantism comes in. Mm. Catholicism negates this and says, not through blood, but through your works. No, we are saved by the blood of the Lamb and not because of any righteousness of our own. So it is set forth to be a propitiation, an offering through faith in his blood. That is my solution. So that I declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. It is God who is good, not me. It is he who remits my sins. It is he who grants me righteousness, which is not mine, but his. It's a gift. Yes. And it is he who enables you to have repentance. Correct. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he may be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So salvation is by faith in Christ's atoning sacrifice. And it is he that not only justifies but sanctifies as well. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. So how am I saved? By faith, faith, right? Through works? No, I'm saved by faith yes. in the atoning blood of Christ. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So there's nothing I can do to save myself. No. It is holy by faith. But now comes the crux of the matter. 
Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Now the Gentiles had a totally new dispensation, according to some, right? Mm. The old system of types and shadows had been removed. Christ had become the reality. But he was the God of the Jews, Yes. And he is the God of the Gentiles. So now the next important question. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith. So how was the Jew saved? By faith. By faith, not by the law, right? No. And the uncircumcision through faith. Yes. So how is the uncircumcised saved? Same way. Same way. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. The problem is not the law. No, it's faith. The problem is me. Yeah. I'm the sinner. So the law doesn't save me. No. The law is the schoolmaster. It tells me what my condition is. Pathetic. Mm. And I have to turn to Christ in order to escape the condemnation of the law, which is eternal death. Now Matthew 5 verse 17 says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So in other words, the law, the first five books of the Bible, which includes the Ten Commandments, Correct. is not gone. And the ceremonial law is also really not gone. It has been accomplished, yes. fulfilled in Christ. In Christ. So the plan of salvation is still the same. So now this question of the law. If there were no law, then what would be the situation? Let me just read you something interesting. Romans 4 verse 15. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. No law, no transgression. 1 John 3 verse 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law. Mm -hmm. For sin is the transgression of the law. Correct. Let's take those two verses. Mm -hmm. Now it gets interesting, yeah. right? So the definition of sin is the transgression of the law. But this verse over here, Romans 4.15 says, where there is no law, there is no transgression. Did Adam and Eve transgress? Yes. What did they transgress? Well, it must have been a law. They must have transgressed the law because if there is no law, mm. then there is no transgression. transgression. And transgression of the law is what sin is. Sin. So, so Adam and Eve sinned. Yes. They transgressed the law. Yes. Okay. What happened to them? They were condemned to death. Correct. But they were promised a savior, mm -hmm. right? Yep. The seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. Yes. And they waited for him to come. So if there is no law, there is no transgression. Now, because there was a transgression, there was a need of a savior. Yes. Correct. Correct. But couldn't God have said, uh, the the law is the problem. Let's yeah, take the take law away. The law. Could he have done that? Well, he's God. He could have he done could it. Could have right? done it. What then? Then there'd be no transgression. Exactly. If there was no transgression, would you need a savior? No. You wouldn't need a savior. So then, what would happen? We would just live without law, <laughs> yeah. and there'd be no transgression. Correct. Uh, it sounds like we would be living in the world such as it is today. <laughs> yes, and that will be the, the world that Lucifer wants. That's the one that Lucifer wants. Because he doesn't want a law, yeah. and he wants to live as he will. Do as thou that wilt world. is the whole of the law. Okay, so let's think this through. So if the law stands, then we are condemned to death because then there is transgression. If there is transgression and you want to be saved, you need a savior. Mm -hmm. 
And the penalty of the law was? Death. Death. So that Savior will have to pay the price. Correct. Did Jesus pay the price? Yes. So does the law stand or is the law gone? That makes the law stand. So the law is immutable. It cannot be moved. It stands. Yes. Therefore, I need a Savior. Mm -hmm. That Savior takes the penalty of the law, which is death upon himself. Yes. Which is the guarantee that not one jot or one tittle will by any means disappear from the law. So if it went for the law, I wouldn't need a Savior. Then Christ needn't have died. Then Christ need not have died. So how important is the law? Important enough to die for? Exactly. Uh huh. All right. Hebrews 2 verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Mm -hmm. It's a very great salvation. Exactly. And it all hung upon the law, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Christ himself came to explain the importance of the law. Correct. And he lived the law. And he demonstrated the precepts of the law. And the precepts of the law are encapsulated in one little word, love. Right? Exactly. And it was so important that he was prepared to die for it. Yes. If we go to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, it says, How shall we escape if we neglect? so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. What is sin? Transgression of the law. Transgression of the law. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So in other words, he took the penalty, he paid the price, and he, as a gift, will impart and impute his righteousness to you. Yes. You can't do anything. Is the law important? The law stands 100%. It's actually solidified by Christ that came to die for us. So the law is eternal. It will exist forever. Yes. And if you negate the law, you negate the plan of salvation. You know, Martin, there's another chapter in the Bible that comes to mind. We must take some time on this issue. I think the confusion comes in with people. That they think people want to keep the law to be saved. You can't keep the law to be saved because a dead man cannot save himself, not even by his own works, right? And that's what I think Paul in Romans brought out beautifully, is that only Christ can help you. It's an outflow of love towards God to keep his law. Well, he says so. If you love me, keep my commandments. Right. He who says he loves me and keeps not my commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So you're not keeping it to be saved. You're keeping it because you love him. Correct. Now, if you go to chapter 59 in the book of Isaiah, actually chapter 59 and chapter 60 are fascinating chapters. Chapter 59 tells us what the state of the world is. And chapter 60 tells us about the message of salvation to a dying world. So these prophecies pertained to the situation then and they pertain to the end of time. I mean, intermingled in the book of Isaiah, you have all these beautiful messianic prophecies, Isaiah 53 and all of these. So there is this application as to the then time mm -hmm. and the end time. And if we read about the situation of humanity at the end of time, and the final message of restoration that is to come to them, this becomes even more clear. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. So we have this concept of a savior. Great. 
And then this verse 2, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. That's Hebrew parallelism. He's saying it in one way mm -hmm. and then he repeats it. So let's read that again. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you. So the iniquity and the sin is the same thing. Mm -hmm. And your sin has separated you from God. Now there's a notion in the world that separation from God is sin. But in actual fact, the biblical definition says that the sin came first, then the separation. Yes. Not the separation first and then the sin. And it's God? a very clever thing to try and negate it sin. Is, because the one way, it's almost as if God retracted himself. Yes. This, and it's not your fault. It's not your fault. Yeah, yeah. it's definitely saying God is still you. It, it, your sin caused the, the, uh, separation. That, that is the separation and his face being hid. Not he hid his face from you. Absolutely. So now, let's just make sure. Go to Isaiah chapter 48 verse 18. And it says there, O thou that hadst, O that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments, then had thy peace been as a river and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. So are the commandments linked somehow to this issue of salvation? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, so let's look at that. Your iniquities, this is verse 2, chapter 59, have separated between you and your God, and your sins had hid his face from you, that he will not hear. And if we backtrack, oh, if you'd only hearkened to my commandments, then your peace would have been like a river. Great peace have they who love their law. You see the connection? Yeah. For your hands are defiled with blood. And then just as Paul gave us our condition, so Isaiah 59 gives the condition of man and says what it's all about. So verse 3 talks about iniquity and lies. And uh, verse 4 tells you that there is no justice and nobody that pleads for truth and uh, that we speak lies, they conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. It sounds like the modern world, yeah. right? They hatch cockatrice eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out under the viper. It's very poetic language telling us what our condition mm. is. It's pretty pathetic. Verse 8 says, The way of peace they know not. Isn't that exactly what Paul said? Yes. He's basically quoting Isaiah, right? Exactly. Yes. If we go down to verse 11, it says, We roar all like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far off from us. Mm. We're hoping for a cue or uh, a Some Messiah to come yeah. that will restore the world. Mm. That's exactly the condition of humanity. Verse 14 says, And judgment is turned away backwards, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Truth. We all know the definition. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. And all thy commandments are truth. Thy law is truth. Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. And then verse 15, Yea, truth falleth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. So our condition is useless without an intercessor. Actually, in my Bible, there's a little star next to verse 16, mm. which says that it is a messianic prophecy. prophecy. 
So we're waiting for that Savior. And so the chapter ends with verse 19 and 20 to 21. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like the flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. So a standard will be lifted up against the evil. What tells us what is evil? The law. The law, because by the law is the knowledge of sin. Yes. So you will tell the people, excuse me, there is a lot of evil in the world yes. because you are transgressing the law. Yes. Great peace have they who love thy commandments. Your peace would have been like the river. And then there is this promise in chapter 60 where it says that there will be a remnant at the end of time that will lift up this standard and tell the people what the heart of the problem is. So it says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee, and behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes around about and see, all they gather themselves together, they come to thee, thy son shall come from far, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then... Thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. This is the final message brought by a remnant, and yeah. many people seeing the iniquity in the world will respond. And then verse 10 says, And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls and their kings shall minister unto thee. Verse 11 says, Therefore thy gates shall be open continually, they shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. For the nation and the kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish, yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. There's only one solution. Mm -hmm. You have to serve God. That means you must come back into harmony with his law. Now, after telling us this final restoration, about this final restoration, again in chapter 61, we are informed that all of this is only possible in Christ. Correct. And you have this marvelous section that Jesus himself read when he announced his Messiahship. For the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all all that mourn, to anoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, and they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. So there is the solution. The Messiah is the one that will save us, not the law. No. But you still have to come into harmony with God's law. Correct. There's, it comes back. It comes from Jesus, but it comes back to the law. So can you leave the law out when you talk about salvation? No. Absolutely not. And yet people are so confused on this issue that they will go so far as to say that Jesus himself was a transgressor. Correct. So let's go and look at that. Because here's a question, if Jesus kept the Sabbath, why does it state in John 9, 14 to 16 and Matthew 12, 1 to 8 that Jesus broke the Sabbath? 
Matthew 15, verse 3, But he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. He actually went so far as to say, In vain you worship me, teaching as commandments the traditions of, of men. So did Jesus ever break the Sabbath? No. no. He never broke the Sabbath. But he kept it contrary to their tradition mm. because their tradition was a man-made law to augment, so they thought, the directives of God. And they placed burdens on people's shoulders that no one was able to bear. Yeah. The Jews had developed about 2,000 laws as to how to keep the Sabbath. the Sabbath. And if you go to the Bible, there are a handful mm -hmm. of directives as to how you should keep the Sabbath. You must call the Sabbath a delight, yes. the Lord's day honorable. You should not neglect the assembly of the saints. You should not be doing your own thing. In other words, your regular day-to-day -day tasks, you should be uh, having a special time with God. You should be doing good on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. You can help people out of their trouble. If someone falls into a ditch or an animal falls into a ditch, you will help them out. You can do good on the Sabbath, but you must call it a delight. So basically, Martin, Jesus kept the Sabbath according to the biblical directive. And he ignored all of the additional rules and regulations that the Jews had made. So according to them, mm. he was breaking the Sabbath, but not according to God. Correct. So we have to understand that the law tells us what sin is, and transgression of the law is sin. Mm. Now Jesus was sinless. That's also important to bring back of how you read your Bible. Because if you read those verses just stay, like it says there, and then you conclude that Jesus broke the law, it's not in harmony with the rest of the Bible. So how can Absolutely. you cannot come to a conclusion that's in any way contradictory to the rest of the Bible? So let us look at two verses to explain this issue. Hebrews 4.15 for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Mm. The Bible is absolutely adamant that Jesus Christ had no sin. Correct. Which means he never transgressed, transgressed the law. No matter what any preacher in this world says Christ was totally sinless. 1 Peter 1.19 confirms it, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, that's how we are saved, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Jesus was the spotless Son of God. He came to redeem Adam's fall. He took upon himself the penalty of a broken law. The law could not be compromised. He paid the price because it couldn't be compromised. Therefore, the law is our schoolmaster that tells us our condition and brings us to Christ. And Christ saves us from the condemnation of the law and then sends us back to the law. Yes. Because he says to the lady caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you. That's salvation. Yes. Go and sin no. no more. Go and stop transgressing the law. Amen. That's the importance of the law. And that's why we preach. You cannot preach law. salvation without preaching 
the law. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there are so many confusions in the world. And so many people believe that God's government doesn't have a standard whereby it is run. What is the standard of judgment? It is the law. And Lord, you have used the law to tell us what our condition is and you have provided the solution through the cross. As we look upon the cross, we can understand the conflict between good and evil. And we see the love of God manifested. And as we look, we live. Thank you for the promise of redemption in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click again to get notifications. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you.